hello everyone. Welcome to History Pitch 5. We are so on a roll. Woohoo, says the studio. I'm Tamsin Peach and here we are freezing our little tushes off at Bruno University. So we have a, a new friend, which is Nathan. Nathan, you're going to have to come close to that microphone uh, to tell us what happened today in history. Um, okay, hello. Hello, Nathan. Um, so in 1492, Christopher Columbus first reaches the island of Santo Domingo, Ooh. to which he, um, he is searching for gold, but will eventually go on to massacre everybody there and uh, yes. be a bit of a jerk. Spread some disease, yeah. spread some pain, suffering. That's, that's the new world. <laughs> okay. Uh, in 1877, the infamous Thomas Edison makes his very first sound recording. Oh, that, that is good. That's quite relevant, I thought, you know, <laughs> yeah. today. Yeah, wow. So homage and to Thomas Edison. Yeah, yay. <laughs> um, the recording was a recital of Mary Had a Little Lamb. Nice Should and quaint. Should we all sing it? As, as I say, <laughs> Mary Had a... Okay, no. <laughs> um, let's see. In 1917, the Bolsheviks imprison um, the Tsar Nicholas II. Oh, gosh, which, a uh, lot happened to this today. The last few weeks have been a bit boring, but you've, like, brought... <laughs> yeah. This is not me, it's the iPhone app. <laughs> <laughs> and is there something else that caught my eye? You said something about the Irish Republic. Oh, yes, right. In 1922, no, in 1921, the Anglo-Irish Treaty is signed, and by 1922, the Irish Free State is born. So the Anglo-Irish Treaty is signed on this day? Yes. In 1921? And it came into effect a year later. Wow. And that reshaped Britain. Mm. Fab. Okay, I've done something wrong here with the tech. Well, that's really good. Thank you, Nathan. Hope you can so come back. Off air now? No, we're on air. All oh, right. We're still, still on air. <laughs> Things stop. I know. Honestly. Technical difficulties pervade yeah. this like, show. <laughs> um, so, what else do we have today? We've got Tavinda back doing Beard and Bay. Be beard or Babe. Maybe Beard and Babe. That's Tavinda's favourite um, favorite thing. We've got Artemis with some more dumb ways to die. I wonder if she can top last week. We have Josie doing the luckiest people alive. And we have special guest star Paige Collings, who is going to be interviewed and is going to tell us who she thinks she is. Erica. Erica is going to join us shortly. Uh, unfortunately, Rob is unable to, uh, to, to, to be phoned today. But we hope to he's back next week with a random country. And Simon, the devil. Uh, oh, and the Internet Pirate Tree Librarian. But I think we might start with Erica, if I can get Erica on board here. And hello, Erica. How are you this week? I'm very well. How are you, Tessman? I am not too bad at all. Very pleased to be rolling on into Krizza. Exactly, exactly. And what have you been up to in the world of cultural activities? Well, I thought this week, in celebration of the Royal First we could pass swiftly by that and talk about death. Oh, we've got okay. <laughs> we've got we've gone from nascent life to death. I like that. So exactly. Have you been rolling in death? How have you been encountering death this week? Do you know what? I went to the cinema twice in three days to see two films about death. Oh gosh, how are you feeling? I'm bearing up all right now. <laughs> Don't recommend it. What does one wear to the cinema? Uh, Oh, we're definitely black in that case. Definitely black. Is that thematically ordered rather than about the venue? Yeah, exactly, exactly. This is this is Leicester's finest art house cinema that we're talking about, so oh, it's not that cool. Art house cinema. That puts a whole new spin on things. Okay, so what did you see? Okay, so this week I saw two films, and I'd recommend one of them, okay? So I saw Michael Haneke's Amor. Oh. And it's hardly surprising I'm recommending it because I'm a Guardian reader and the Guardian's been all over this. But it's wonderful. It's um, a story about an old couple and they're eight years tired. They still flash, still good friends. And then the woman has a stroke and that's combined with dementia. And sort of about her slow progress towards death as she sort of loses her faculties and becomes sort of an unrecognisable person. And this old man in his 80s has to watch her, you know, like clean up after she goes to the toilet, all these sorts of things. And it's just that, it's just absolute harrowing. And he looks after her? I mean... Yeah, he's kind of on his own. Like, other people give him advice and don't really do anything. It's sad. But the sort of historian thing that I'm very obsessed with is, is these are in 
don't see. You know, there's, there's very little trouble production relating to older people or to do with sickness or illness. Mm. Um, I thought it was really striking and surprising. And touching. I mean, the, I guess that the equivalent might be Iris, the film Iris, about Iris Murdoch, which was a similar sort of premise. But I haven't seen Ah. <laughs> Okay, so putting, I mean, how did placing death at the centre and age and illness feel for the cinema audience, the audience girls? I guess they knew what they were going to get. Yeah, it was comfortable thing doing. I have to say, by and large, I was the youngest person in the cinema, and also a very old people had gone to see it. So it's kind of interesting that they actually wanted to see their lives' problems reflected back to them. Do you think it's um, sort of playing out some of the anxieties of the baby boom generation who are now all hitting retirement and worrying about these things and this is as much a fantasy for them about how to age well in a way and how to be looked after as it is I don't know, dramatising their fears. Well it's exactly you're right, it's the boom generation all over isn't it, because they always get what they want, it's never part of a boom in culture for old people Yeah they always bloody get what they want Okay so this was this was a touching sort of tale of easing into the grave What what about the other no, second but, film? It was, it was harrowing and brutal and awful, there was nothing touching about it So there was no, re- there's no redemption in here No. Love no. does not save either of them. No no, it's, it's, the end is very bleak, I warn you. But the other film, just to quickly, because I don't think I have much time, to about the other film, was also about death. It was Alps oh, yes. by Lathamon. Uh, it's a Greek film, it has a, uh, made in 2011, it's only just been released in British cinemas. And it's about a troupe of actors who get paid by bereaved families to impersonate the person they've lost. Oh, gosh. So the families are hiring them to deceive them. Yeah, exactly. And they wear the clothes of the person who's died. They try and impersonate the speech. They sort of uh, take on their old hobbies. You know, all these sorts of things. And it's quite dark because obviously, you know, as far as it's the end, the reason these actors are doing this is because of their own sense of loss and bereavement. Yeah. So that's well. I mean, you, you sound like you're not recommending this one. I loved it more, and I thought that more was amazing and really, really important, if very, very difficult. Out was rubbish, actually. It didn't actually work as a film, and, and um, the plot wasn't great. This set director made Dogtooth a couple of years ago about this weird family. That was a uh, Hulk set. And I really, really like Dogtooth. It's basically, I don't see Dogtooth, don't see Alps. You see what? Sorry, you see... See, Dolby, which is the more famous film by the same Oh, okay, okay. Is there anything, I mean, we can take about these films being out at the same time, or is that pure coincidence, you think? Are we having a moment? We're having a what? A death moment, maybe? Yes, maybe. Like, in the face of depression in Europe and... Exactly, like, I don't think it's any surprise that one of us have a Uh, yeah. No, you're interesting. And it's about it's also about simulation in a way. Exactly. You know, the veils um, that we draw. Austerity cinematography. Austerity cinematography. You heard it here, ladies and gentlemen. Exactly. Yeah. Baby boom austerity. Well on that note, Erica, as we head into the dark days of winter, I think yeah. death was slightly appropriate a topic. Yeah. Yeah. Merry Christmas. Yeah, Merry Christmas everyone. Yeah. We hope to see you next week. Okay, yeah. Okay. Bye. Hi. Thank you very much, Erica. It's depressing, but you know, we, winter, it's winter, winter is upon us. So back to the studio where Josie, and I've even put the mic up, is here to tell us who is the luckiest person alive this week. Well, today I've got two people because that's kind of a theme of sort of double instances. And I'm not sure how lucky these people were because they both had really unlucky instances that happened twice. Okay. So the first one lightning, is... Lightning, lightning. Uh, no, uh, <laughs> Violet Jessup, who in 1911 worked as a stewardess on board RMS Olympic uh, when oh, it crashed. That sounds familiar from a certain course I'm teaching. <laughs> and in 1912, she was also the stewardess aboard the Titanic and she was ordered onto oh. a lifeboat and she was handed a baby. But what's really weird is that she sort of kept hold of this baby when they were rescued and then when they were on the rescued boat, a woman sort of ran up, took the baby and just ran off without saying a word. So I don't know if that was actually the woman's baby or if she just took this baby or what. So the baby sounds quite unlucky. Kind of, but <laughs> it was identified later and I don't know if it, he was actually um, sort of... Reclaimed. Uh, yeah. 
Um, Hang on, let's just let's just re- recapture this. So she survives the Titanic crash, the sinking, sinking yeah, and she survives also um, the Olympic crash, and uh, she was also a nurse aboard the Britannic in 1916 when it sank, and she sort of she was on a lifeboat, but it was being sucked into the propeller, so she jumped out, but ended hitting the um, sort of keel of the boat anyway, and. She claims it was her large amounts of hair that protected her from drowning by sort of softening the blow to her head. And then she was rescued by a lifeboat and saved and lived happily ever after until she died of heart failure at age 83. I mean, it's remarkable. This is coming back to our theory that you need to be quite unlucky in order to be lucky. Yeah, see, this next guy is uh, Sotumu Yamaguchi, who was one of the um, 165 people to survive both um, nuclear bombings of Japan. So he was in Hiroshima uh, on a business trip, and he was very badly burned, and then sort of two days later he goes to Nagasaki, where he's from, and (laughs) gets bombed again. But he survived that, and his wife and baby son also survived and stayed in shelter for a week. And he lived until 2010, when he died... um, age 93, having battled leukemia for years. And it's quite incredible, really. Uh, extremely unlucky, but also extremely lucky. That is remarkable. Um, it's tr- yeah, extremely unlucky, but... I mean, trauma. <laughs> trauma. Simon says this week he doesn't believe in trauma studies. Isn't that right, Simon? But um, I get a bit cross at Simon this week, as you'll, you'll hear quite soon. But surely, I don't know, two, two atomic bombs is not going to do something good to your... Not really, but he then went on to speak to the UN and he talked a lot about it later in his life to try and uh, tell his story to people, to try and make sure that nuclear bombs weren't used again. So something good kind of did come out of it. So he made a profession out of it? Uh, Not entirely, but he did give a lot of talks. Good. World peace. I mean, oh, I'm getting criticism from across the room. Um, thank you, JC. That was incredibly two people who could have died twice, three times. Okay, so now let's re- continue with this theme of trauma and, and see what um, Simon has to say for himself this week. <laughs> you fool. And welcome to Commodionally Simon. Hello, Simon. Hi, uh, I'm back. Bahumbug, uh, you're preempting. So, Simon, last week we gave you the task of telling me, of defending Tolkien's work, telling me why it's not replete with racist and sexist truth. Well, it is replete with racism and sexism. Uh, the dwarves he describes as being Semitic, the language is Semitic, and if you read the descriptions of them, it comes across as kind of a very 19th century stereotype of Jews, women. Uh, some of the survey worked out there are only 19, only 19% of the population of Middle Earth are women. So those women are very busy, or the men are very, I don't know, spending a lot of time on their own. So it's there. But I think it's a bigger work. Hang on, hang on. Have you conceded the point from the get-go? Have I won this already in the first 20 seconds? No, I've nuanced it. I've, I've like, I mean, talking was influenced by the First World War. He, he, you know, he fought on the, about the song. What I've, what I've done is I've, I've nuanced things. All right, go, go, nuance, nuance away. So, yeah, I've kind of retreated. It's like 1918, I've retreated. You're the German army, you're coming at me. <laughs> and your supply lines are going to be overstretched and I'm going to hit you back. The 100 days are coming now. Really? Okay, look, I wait to see this because I think, I think I've got some ammunition in store. So why is, it, why is there a more complex argument to be made? I think what Tolkien was doing was trying to get the northern myths and the impact of the First World War was to kind of rework those ideas of honour, chivalry, good and evil, particularly particularly evil, for a world that had been changed by the First World War. Okay, but so can't we see that as an attempt to impose categories of good and evil upon a world that, upon a world that had proved itself actually a lot more confusing and complicated? Well, his idea of good and evil is much more complicated than you would find in, say, Paradise Lost. And the assumption that good will triumph over evil is not actually there. A lot of what goes on in The Lord of the Rings is might makes right. 
and the uncomfortableness of might makes right. I, I'm, I'm not actually agreeing with you on here. I think this is. I think that the racial and the gender stereotypes are actually key to this reassertion of forms of certainty, this imposition of forms of certainty, and, and the projection of good and bad onto these categories. Well, look at the people who are seduced by evil. I mean, it's it's uh, Saruman, uh, king of Gondor. Oh, sorry, not the king of Gondor. The was it the warden or something of Gondor. These are these are people who are very senior in that society who are seduced by evil or corrupted by evil, and often what corrupts them is trying to do what they feel is good with something evil. It's, it is it's more sophisticated than you're making out. So you're saying that I'm I'm uh, bringing a sort of narrow, thin. Guardian sort of analysis to this, Simon. I would say that. I mean, if you if, if you go online, you can you can pick and choose what you want to find online. So you can find online people who are angry white men who immediately react to accusations of sexism and homophobia by being sexist and homophobic regarding the book. I mean, have you googled? Have you googled Tolkien online? I mean, that, there is like thousands and thousands upon thousands of chat rooms in which man children make exactly those sorts of claims. I have. There's also thousands and thousands and thousands of pages in, in which women have Sam and Frodo having a very tender romantic relationship. What I'm saying is that he has created something so sophisticated. It's more than an allegory. It's not about the First World War. It's not about the Second World War. It's not about the atomic bomb. It's much bigger than that. So you can do what you want with it, almost. You can say, OK, this is about the war on terror. Or you can switch it around and say, OK, um, Mordor is America. You can, you can, it's really rich. And so people can go into this book, and if they are already sexist, if they are already homophobic, if they are already racist, then they can build on that and say this is about how great uh, Europe is and how it's being threatened by Islam or whatever. Equally, they can go in there and they can find empowerment for ideas of homosexuality, ideas of femininity. I mean, it's pretty hard to find the empowerment of ideas of industrial working class culture in that book. It's pretty hard. I mean, Tolkien clearly does not believe in the Industrial Revolution. Well, lots of left-wing people around the time he was writing didn't believe in the Industrial Revolution. I mean, part of, the, part of the, what's interesting about the kind of sexism and racism argument is it's displaced earlier ideas about how the Industrial Revolution was a trauma for the working class of England. But now, if you, if you bring in sexism, if you bring in racism, the kind of classic enemy of that is the angry white working class male. So the person who, who in many ways is seen as a victim in The Lord of the Rings is now seen as a sort of an, of an aggressor. If you look at what's going on, with the Shire at the end, something which doesn't feature in the, the movies, when the Shire is taken over by Saruman and industrialization arrives, it's suffering for the, the, the hobbits, that kind of English country life has been destroyed, which is something... But that's a fiction. I mean, it's a fiction, this nostalgic re, re, you know, uh, reinvigoration of a, like, a happy England in which everyone toddled around with you know, bare feet and drinking beer. I mean, this never existed. Well, this, 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 actually, the Shire is more sophisticated than the movies makes out. There are, these, there are these tensions, there's gossip, there's things like that. But certainly, having your own farm, there's being no... part of that community... Is better than being a uh, proletariat. But come on, don't historians massively disagree with this and say that, you know, you can, like, living conditions in rural Britain before the Industrial Revolution were anything but good? It's better than Manchester in the 1840s. I mean, you've got mobility. And look, we're not going to be arguing about the relative merits of the Industrial you just Revolution. Love, you just love mobility. It's not all about mobility. Sometimes it's just nice to stay it's there. It's not about being indentured on your land either, or the land of your master. Well, Tolkien actually liked this idea. I mean, remember, Tolkien is not from a privileged background. And t Tolkien said, you know, tugging your forelock is not good for the master, but it is good for you. So, I mean, so he's, he's identifying more with Sam than he is with Frodo. OK, OK, but I'm not sure that necessarily helps your case, Simon. I'm not sure that helps your case. I mean, maybe he's wanting to recreate an idealised view of England. I mean, let's not kid. Tolkien is hardly a member of the working class. He's a Oxbridge Don drinking port in 1930s homo social Oxford, right? Alternatively, alternatively. Who has come out of a homo social experience in the army. He's someone who lost his father, who grew up in relative poverty, won a scholarship to Oxford, did superbly at Oxford after he graduated joined the army and was a very young man was present at the Battle of the Somme where he lost two of his three best friends. And that's when he started writing what becomes The Lord of the Rings. Now that does not in any way, that experience does not in any, any way um, invalidate or discount. In fact, it might bolster his, his desire to impose 
racial and sexual certainties. The, the, the trauma of the experience. I think to a certain extent you could argue, if you were gonna, I don't, I'm not a big fan of trauma, you could say that you got trapped in, in that moment to a certain extent. Well, that, that moment is of being a schoolboy. And... Yeah, like the man children that read him. Look, Simon, I think we must draw this conversation to a close. I'm starting to get a bit irate. You are, you, I can see your head actually expanding. Yeah, it's, it's almost going to, going to explode. Such yeah. as the, is the force of your arguments not? Well, I think Peter Jackson probably could do some interesting special effects work with your head. <laughs> All right. So while my head explodes, I'm going to give you a, a topic for next week, uh, which should suit your curmudgeonly self, I think. Someone okay. as um, scroogey as you can take down Dickens. So why has Dickens ruined Christmas for us all? Oh, fantastic. I'm on that straight away. All right. Done. We'll see you Good. next week. Bye. Bye. Oh, that ended well, didn't it, Simon? Um, so back back to the studio. Uh, we now have special guest star Paige Collings. Hello, Paige. Hey. Hi. Say hello. 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 Hi. Yeah, yeah. Lick the microphone. Um, <laughs> uh, you are a first year student. I am. It's very nice to have you. Thank you. Yeah. Now, um, this is a segment where we sort of talk about family history, sort of, and it can kind of go any direction we choose to make it go. So, where did you grow up? Nobody here will know, because anywhere above Watford is north. Watford? <laughs> <laughs> I certainly won't know. Chesterfield. Chesterfield. Oh, near oh, the Peak that's District. near the Lake District. No, the Peak District. Peak District, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I say that because I have a friend that has just started a job as professor at the University of Chester? Chesterfield? It's Chester? not near there, it's really. Near there. No, Chester's more north. More north? Yeah. But it's still near mountains? Um, I guess. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> okay. Chesterfield's nicer than Chester. Is it nicer? Yeah, Chester has a nicer name, but just field. Yeah, it's nicer. So what's Chesterfield into? Like, is that a small town? Is yeah, it a it's a market town? town. Have a crooked spire. Ooh. Yeah, so any day it could fall. Any day so we just take the risk to keep it. <laughs> it's like the Leaning Tower of Pisa. It really it's, is. It's England's Leaning Tower of Pisa. Yeah, it has to have scaffolding around it. Yeah. Because it's going to fall. Really? I think so. And nobody thinks that... No, it's like up... this is the only artefact, like, or only landmark of Chestfield. Like, you have Chestfield, then you have the spire next to it. Uh-huh. So if we get rid of the spire, then we've got nothing next to oh, it. <laughs> so we have I to keep it. like, the local paddies is taking bets on when this is going. I hope so. I think it's got another 50 years, isn't it? So okay, care, that's a long game. It's if you place a bet now, you're not going to get... <laughs> not gonna, he's not going to come in soon. <laughs> so, um, so you grew up in Chesterfield, and now you've come down to London. Um, so what... Tell us what the North is like. It's the Midlands. <laughs> it's the Midlands. Uh, it's nice. It's nice. The Midlands is nice, yeah. I don't How far are you from much. the sea? Great question, actually, because Chesterfield is the... Only like it's the ch- the town in the UK furthest away from any seaside. Does that mean you never eat seafood? No, I mean we have seafood. <laughs> we just don't have fresh seafood. Ah. <laughs> um. So it's a town. Is that is that? Yeah, right? that's a real fact. Okay. So that means it's probably about fifty miles from the sea. Because the, the closest seaside's like two hours away. Okay. That's 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 kind of Mablethorpe. Mablethorpe. Yep. Is that that way or that way? East or west? Left or Maybe right? Maybe northeast. Northeast. I think so. Okay. So, um, so you grew up in Chesterfield. Now, tell us about your family history. Your parents were from Chesterfield. How come you came? How come your family lives there? Uh, well, my granddad on my mum's side was from yep. Jamaica. Your pater- no, your maternal grandfather. Yep. Yes. <laughs> so I know from doing my How British Is Townsend and Life in the UK test that a lot of migrants came from the Caribbean in the post-war period. Is he part of that wave of migration? Yes. Yes. And does he go north or do you... Does he go south? How does how do you end up in Chesterfield? I don't know the answer to that question, but the, the whole... the Like, all his brothers, they all came and then occupied one street. Oh, cool. And my uncle was the first black man to be born in Chester. Really? Yeah. How did he find that? I mean, it's just a well-known fact in Chesterfield. <laughs> He's the black man. <laughs> I'll put a statue up to him. Um, I was outraged in the studio. Um, so what about the other side of the family? Uh, they're from um, Ireland. Are they? Yeah. So how come? They, how did they come over? Oh, I know this from my life in the UK test, that a lot of Irish migrants... <laughs> 
came came well I'm not asking which bit she fits into okay which bit do you fit into the 19th century bit or the 20th century migrations from Ireland I don't know you don't know no I really don't know that side that much this is I your inquired I will over Christmas yeah inquire over Christmas I'll let you know yeah come back <laughs> well, um <laughs> Gosh, this, so this is like you found this too, Devinda. That you had to like ask your nan about your family history. Is that right? Yeah, she's <laughs> nodding. <laughs> um, so, so they're Irish, right? Yeah. So, do they gypsies, still have Irish right? Irish gypsies? They were. So they're travellers. Um, Not now. <laughs> no, but that's different than being like Irish um, labourers that come over to either. Well, build... you see, there were Irish gypsies in Ireland, and then they came over. Yeah. Yeah. So they were, they weren't gypsies in England. But then they settled here. Yes. Yeah. But as opposed to the crofters and the people that came off the farms after yeah, the they famine. Weren't. They weren't those. They weren't affected by the famine. They were so they came later than that? I think so. Okay. I mean I asked and they were affected by the famine and the answer was no, so okay. can I presume they came later. Yeah. Um did they do they still have Irish accents? No. No. Not all. I mean that's not a silly question. So my I mean you laugh. People laugh. You no, my granddad had a Jamaican accent. Yeah. Yeah, he was here exactly. for 60 years and it never went. It doesn't go away. And even, um, so my, some of my family were Germans that moved to Australia and they spoke German for 100 years, right? So they very much had accents, even though they lived, they were born there and they were like third generation, which is weird, right? So I don't think that's a stupid question. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, okay, so... Is, is are there a lot of Irish? Is there an Irish travelling community in not, the no, not, Chesterfield as well? No, not all really. So this is quite, and you're like the product of a quite interesting conjunction. Of I think so. Global forces. Yeah. 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 Just as well you're doing making of the modern world with Doctor. <coughs> that was why I chose it. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't get a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> no, I did. Did you? Yeah. Oh, high five. People see that's excitement. Um, uh, thank you, Paige. We'll come back to you. But I think we'll we'll switch now to um, Beard or Babe. So we're going to swing the mic over, which will make a nice noise. Hello, Tavinda. Hey. Nice to have you back. Nice to be back. We missed you last week. I missed it too, but oh. it was a great show. So it was a great show. Brilliant. It was a great show. How many deadlines did we get, Josie? More than 50. Ooh. <laughs> yours? More than 20. Only 10, only 10 of them were me. Yeah. But I was forcibly playing them to my classes. So that increased Forcibly our, playing. That increased our listenership. <laughs> mm. So I was... We I was get the first ones I could Yeah, there you are. Um, and now she's here. So, Tavinda, uh, we've got two tasks today. One is to tell us about a beard or a babe. And the other yep. is to tell us about the History Society. I think I'll start with the History Society, Ooh, actually. Okay. So next week, the History and Politics Societies are having a Christmas party. Happy days. Happy days, indeed. We're going to have a great time. There's going to be lots of booze and um, some lovely cheese and crackers. It's next Thursday on the 13th in Newton Room South. Uh-huh. Uh, time? Time from 6 to 10. And there'll be two live bands, not one, Ooh. but two. Two great live bands that we've um, scouted from the Live Music Society. Are they local? Yeah, they're Brunel's Brunellians. Brunel. They're Brunellians. It would be brilliant. <laughs> Brunel's own students playing for us. Wow, be very okay. good. So, yeah, turn up to the party. We'll have a few tickets to sell at the door. But um, if not, get in touch with the History Society and we'll sell you a lovely ticket. Okay, can I buy a ticket? Yes, you can. Are we going to do a live sort uh, of sale? Let's do a live sale. A live I mean, sale. I my, thought, pa- my, is Paige selling yes, you a ticket? My money is outside. Um, oh, sorry, I can't see but we can pretend to sell me one. We can pretend I to sell have me just one. bought a ticket, everyone. Jasmine <laughs> has a ticket in her hand and she's waving it up in the air. <laughs> You're also, um, hello, Jagvia. You're also um, having an auction, aren't you? We're having a raffle now. Ooh, a, a raffle. raffle. Yeah, which you still have yet to donate something to. I will donate some wine. Some wine, <laughs> brilliant. Come to the party, take part in our raffle and win some wine donated by Tanzan. You could also win a slot on History Pitch. Yes, you can. <laughs> Prized guest slot, and you can come and say anything you like as long as it's not swearing. As long as it's fine. A swear word. As long as you don't swear. That's all I do. Say so anything <laughs> I like. Um, yeah, so that will be fun. Okay, do we have to wear Christmas hats? Um, you can if you want to, okay. but just come dressed in smart formal clothing. Oh, smart formal. Smart, smart, yeah, smart casual. Okay. Sort of just um, mm. look good. 
Mm. Well, have, I wonder if Erica, trashy. Erica should give us some advice maybe <laughs> yeah, tomorrow some, morning. Some fashion ne- tips yeah. on what to wear at the Christmas party. Oh, that's so good. That's so good. That okay. would be brilliant. Erica, can you hear that? Um, Please, Erica. Historicising Christmas. That's Please. what we need. <laughs> uh, so, okay, thank you. And and now, now, to beard or babe. To beard or babe, indeed. So this week we have a beard. Oh, my. Yay. Oh my. And I've gone back a lot further than I usually go back. Uh, all the way back to... The tenth century. Oh gosh. Da, 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 da. Yay. That's, that's real history. <laughs> real history. Going back to um someone that you know someone who doesn't do history might call a Viking. But he's not a Viking, he's just a Norse explorer. His name is Leif Erikson. Oh yay. yay. So what's the difference between a Viking and a Norse explorer? Uh Viking's just a very generalized term for anyone of Scandinavian origin. But they're not all Vikings, but they because they don't all go and pillage. But hang on, hang on. If if Viking is a generalized term for anyone of Scandinavian generalized origin. term for someone who doesn't know their history. Generalized ignorant term. Oh, ouch! That Viking <laughs> equals bad history. Bad history. <laughs> Get it hashtag. right, people. Okay, so so he's a Norse explorer. He's a Norse explorer slash raper and pillager of. The, the, <laughs> not the quite. Early well, um, <laughs> we'll see. He um, well, he's generally regarded as the first European to land in North America, almost five hundred years before Christopher Columbus. Uh, whose birthday it is? No, what did he do uh, today? He, he just got, okay, Santa, Santa Domingo. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so it wasn't Christopher Columbus who was the first European to land in North America. It was Leif Erikson. Leif. Well, allegedly Leif Erikson. Okay. Allegedly. So Leif Erikson was born in the 1970s in Iceland. No, in the 1070s. 1970s. Oh, he 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 was born in the 1970s, nine, 970s, not 1970s. 1970s. <laughs> Sorry, getting my dates wrong. I'm very ill. Um, so he was born in the nine, nine 70s, and he died in the sort of 1020s. How do we know that? There's lots of um, sort of sagas and tales about him because he was a very famous explorer in Norse, Norse sort of history and mythology um, so that there is some evidence of his life and where he went and he established quite a few colonies mm, where? in um, well, what he called Vineland but what is thought to be present day Newfoundland in Canada mm. yeah Th- that was that was quite a recent um, discovery and only the sort of 1960s did people find out that that was where Vinland was located. Okay, wow. Okay, so we've got this kind of Arctic c- c- empire. Yeah, Arctic empire. He was the son of Eric the Red, Ooh. who started the did first... Did he have a red beard, Eric the Red? Well, we don't know, really. We don't know. Let's say he did. Because, yeah, er- he had a red beard. Yeah. Let's let's go with that. They had lovely long beards. Uh, so Eric the Red started the first European settlement of Greenland um, in 985, and so Leif went with his father to Greenland. He was born in Iceland, but then they moved to Greenland and stayed there till about a thousand year year one thousand. Mm-hmm. And um, then he himself explored the Arctic. Well, actually, his discovery of North America was by accident. It wasn't intended. <laughs> he was going. He went to Norway, uh, where his family was originally from, and then he was going back to Greenland, but he was blown off course and ended up in North America. I mean, this would have been in an open sort of small Viking ship. Yeah, yeah. They're they're pretty... That's amazing to have crossed the Atlantic. Exactly. It's it, His exploration just carries on after that. He doesn't stop. He just goes on and on, and it's just... It's amazing. Where does he go after America? He sort of um, establishes a few colonies around there, and he just d- sort of travels around the Arctic a bit. But then he drops off the map for a couple right. of years, and that's when you think he's died. But then, but he hasn't died. Well, you don't know. You, there, there's some evidence of him passing on his sort of title of chief to his son in the late 19, 10, <laughs> 10, um, 30s, 10, 20s, 10, sort of around that time. Dates are very vague. There's no sort of okay. So solid... are, are these part of the dreaded Viking invasions? No, of... he's he's kind of loved in a sense because America now celebrates Leif Erikson Day on October the 9th 
it's really strange because he never actually went to what is now mainland America. He only ended up in like sort of Canada, but um, now he has this great importance of being um, this figure that's just became really important to the Nor Nor the Nordic um, Americans and the immigration mm. wave of Nordics to America, and then it was sort of adopted by them. Isn't that interesting that this like quest to recover some kind of um, or produce some kind of ancestor, right? Yeah. It's not enough. It's not enough to think that there might be Native American peoples here who knew that this country existed long, long yeah. before we need to. Exactly. You need a European to justify that. Create a yeah. kind of. Yeah. Um, but but that the Irish are looking for their, mm. you know, the first arrivals, the, the English are looking to the Puritans, the yeah. Nord Nordic immigrants are looking to the. Um, yeah. Um, to Eric. Yeah, so. Eric. And then he's recognised by Calvin Coolidge in 1925 um, as being the official first European to discover Americas. Well, <sighs> North America. Dubious honour. Yeah. So we can blame him. Yeah. And then they all celebrate Leif Erikson Day and there's plenty of statues of him in all his hmm. Viking glory. Thank you, Tavinda. Um, I've, I've learnt a lot. I've learnt a lot about... Leif Erikson. Leif Erikson. Yeah. So, Brilliant. next, um, we have our favourite segment. Um, and let us see. Let us see. <laughs> oh, ladies and gentlemen, life's very good. Set fire to your hair. Poke a stick at a grizzly bear Eat medicine that's out of date Use your private parts as piranha bait Dumb ways to die So many dumb ways to die Dumb ways to die That's right. Um, Artemis, what have you got? I've got a microphone now, which is great. <laughs> Edit that one out. Yeah, I'm talking to you. I don't know if you heard that before. Okay, I have two deaths today. <laughs> two? Yes, two. Uh, the first one is death by suicide during a live TV news broadcast. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Which is not very dumb, but it, it's impressive. Pretty I mean. tragic. Okay, so Christine Chabak was the first and only TV news reporter to commit suicide during a live television broadcast. On July 15, 1974, eight minutes into the broadcast, the depressed reporter said, In keeping with Channel 40's policy of bringing you the latest in blood and guts, and in living colour, you are going to see another first, an attempted suicide. Oh. With what? Chabak drew up a, a revolver and shot herself in the head. <laughs> Impressive, isn't it? I mean, it, it competes with the, the guy who died from a robot. I mean, but I don't know if it's better. I, I don't, you will judge that. I, I can't judge that. Um, um, I'm slightly shocked. I didn't expect that story to end like that. Why? Come on, come on. It, it, it was straightforward. Yeah. It was a su <laughs> committing suicide during a live report. So. And it wasn't attempted. It was yes, successful. Yes, she I succeeded. Guess. Really was there was there ramifications? Did people write in and complain to the national broadcast? I don't know. Did Ofcom get involved? I haven't followed it up, but you know, it was the seventies. Probably not. Okay. They were probably happy. <laughs> we do not endorse this opinion, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> um, history pitch does not endorse. Okay, what's number two? Let's see. So uh, the second one is death by beard. Ooh. Oh, oh, oh! Tavinder and you are like been talking, haven't you? <laughs> Okay, so Austrian has Hans Steininger was famous for having the world's longest beard. It was 4.5 feet, or nearly 1.4 meters long, and for dying because of it. Uh, one day in 1567, there was a fire in town, and in his haste, Hast, Hans, sorry. Haste. Oh, no. Uh, Hans. 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 The Hans was uh, the problem. In his haste, Hans. Yeah, yes. exactly. Forgot to roll up his beard. He accidentally stepped on his beard, lost balance, stumbled, broke his neck, and died. <laughs> so it, it's, it, it's dreadful. And it's dumb. So, yeah. Okay. I don't know. That's... that's wow. Um, yeah, so don't grow a beard. I mean, we learned a lot. What did we learn last week? Uh... Don't mess with robots. Don't mess with robots. Yeah. Don't take a gun into a broadcasting studio. Yeah. And 
I keep your beard in check. Um, so bringing back the mic over here to, to Paige. Um, now, Paige, I, um, I know you have a Twitter account. <laughs> why are you called Paige Collings MP on Twitter? Just why not? Because you're not no, actually this is a, a member this of is Parliament. Funny because when I went to Parliament... When you went to Parliament as yeah, a non-elected as in visitor. International, I, went for inter, I was invited for International Women's Day. Okay. And then met the Speaker and Sally Baker. Woo-hoo. Went to the house. Nice. I, got, I actually got lost and What's then I went to like? that pier. She's actually, she's actually really nice. Yeah. She's really misrepresented in the press. Is she? Yeah, she's really nice. I mean, okay. Because we she's, speak quite a lot, you know. You, you speak? Honestly, I'm not, being, I'm not joking. Because, okay, so she's a Labour supporter. And, and he, he's a Conservative. He's a Conservative. Yeah. Uh, did you talk about that? We spoke, she gave a talk on um, women in politics. Uh-huh. And then um, we went to the House. Like the, 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 Which is in Parliament House, right? It is, yeah. It's very grand. Yeah. And um, we just spoke about, like, just general things. And, like, the male online hate us. So they always yeah. give, like, really bad stories. Um, but, yeah, it's, quite, it's kind of cool, I think. Yeah, I totally. Yeah. So, so you, so you're saying you went to Parliament House. Yeah, and so I was like, I'm just going to put MP on the end of my name, um, but she follows me on Twitter, so I just, <laughs> I just thought it'd be really funny if you could retweet us. <laughs> so Sally Bird, that would be great. <laughs> History pitch, Paige Collins. Remember her? I'll ask it. Yeah, I do. Okay, I'll tweet it. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Shout out. Um, so you have a Twitter account. You also have a Facebook account. There is somebody in the studio here who has neither of those things. Hello, Nathan. Hi. Hi. You don't have a Facebook account. Can I ask why this is a big deal? <laughs> well, everyone... You see, um, when everyone just laughed then, so I really must know what... So can everyone who thinks this is quite remarkable in this room go shout? Yeah. Yeah, this is a big deal, right? <laughs> how, do you, how do you find out about History Pitch? How did I find out? Well, you speak about it in every single lecture, so I would have gotten the message <laughs> eventually. <laughs> Okay, so word of mouth is a viable communication yeah. strategy. Yeah. Um, what about... Do you have a mobile phone? Yes. <laughs> okay. But you've said, you said earlier that you, you created a Facebook page for yourself and then you um, deleted it. Mm. So what was the thought process behind that journey, that digital journey? I felt I was wasting too much time on there, actually, and I wasn't really getting anything else of it, so... Who else in this room feels that they waste time on Facebook? Me. That was at least four hands that went up. Um, so this doesn't seem an obstacle to other people. And you weren't getting anything out of it. Yeah. Were you annoyed by pictures of babies? Um, I was annoyed by most things, yeah. yeah. You know, just the really dull stuff about people making their lives look interesting and stuff like that. You know, it's just... So you think it's like, it's not actually... This is interesting, though, that Facebook is a performance of your life. It's not uh, actually yeah. transparent. Yeah, I think it's that's a, it's right. something you create and... You, you know, there's a kind of art to doing witty Facebook status updates that don't actually overshare. The overshare is a very annoying thing on Facebook, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, have you ever been accused of being a Luddite? Um, <laughs> not really. The I, I don't think so. And, uh, yeah, the anti-technology movement in the industrial era. That's yeah, People right. going around breaking machines. I, I don't actively sabotage Facebook accounts or anything <laughs> like that, if that's what you're implying. But... No, but you're resistant. You're resistant to technological... Uh, yeah, I mean, this but is where we... See, um... Here's my historical connection, you see. Oh, well see done. Yeah, I, I yeah. tried to protest against yeah. this because I didn't see how it's relevant to history, but yeah. let's see. Also, it's part of forms of self-fashioning. Well, which is we're interested in the ways people fashion their identities throughout time. And the internet is a major historical you know, development, I think. I think we can't pre- pretend that it's not. Um, I, believe it or not, because I'm quite old, I went through university and we didn't even have email or mobile phones. So we, didn't we had... We didn't have email. What? I know I'm not... you didn't have email. <laughs> <laughs> Josie thinks that I'm technologically <laughs> illiterate, which... It's not wholly true. It's just that my technological reading age is about four. Um, so she is responsible for every way of accessing History Pitch online. Thank you very much, Josie. Yeah. Um, she's blushing. Uh, so, OK. <laughs> um, so we've done Dumb Ways to Die. What else do we have left? We've got, how, we've got the itinerant poetry librarian. <laughs> so let's play her. Let's, let's see where she is at this week. Um, play. <laughs> Hello and welcome. Today we have an American theme. We have 
an excerpt from the archive by the Poetry Centre and American Poetry Archive, which is by the poet Charles Olson. He's reading from the Maximus poems, and it was originally recorded in San Francisco Museum of Art on February 21st, 1957. But first up, we have a valued patron of the library, a.k.a. Okay, I'm Barb Tettenbaum, and I live here in Portland, Oregon. I am a printer myself, and I also teach letterpress printing and bookbinding at a small arts and crafts college called the Oregon College of Art and Craft in Portland, Oregon. Yeah, I'm a proud owner of two, children, two cats and a nice old English bike. When you're printing poetry and you're setting it letter by letter and you're proofing it and you're feeding it through the press and you're checking, you know, the impression and you're checking for the spacing and you're checking again and again for any broken letters and and then you're printing it and you're kind of looking at it you feel like in a way you're reading the poem almost more than the poet ever did I was going to say that you that's practically the the process that the poet goes through in terms of creating the poem in itself yeah Yeah. but if you're doing a large edition you really are reading that poem over and over and over and over again And, and there's something so incredible about that it's like a gift that is unexpected for me in my life was unexpected. We start with movable type, which is um, the letter forms, the individual letter forms that are cast in a combination of lead, zinc, is it, and antimony. I'm trying to remember the formula. And I am blessed in my studio here with what's called foundry type, which is really good, hard metal type from Europe. And so you set the type in what's called a composing stick with all kinds of spacing material that's also made to fit in between. You push that into your printing press, and what I use is called a Vandercook proofing press. And the Vandercook is um, an American flatbed cylinder press, an SP-15, for anyone out there who's a nerd about it. And then what else do I have in there that I use? So furniture is used to fill out the bed of the press. You move your type into the bed of the press, and it's it would just fall apart if you tried to ink it up and and print it. So you have to lock it in, and you lock it in with what's called furniture, which is all of these pieces of wood and metal that are larger that fit around the type. And then you use a coin, which is a great Scrabble word, Q-U-O-I-N, and a key to lock everything in. And then you're feeding your paper around the cylinder, which is packed with what's called tympan, which is um, a certain material that's meant to absorb some of the pressure of the type. And then there's inking rollers that go over the form and ink it just before the impression is made. And I also have a paper cutter, which is called a board shear. So you can cut binder's board and paper very accurately and cleanly on that. And I also have um, sewing frames and all sorts of things for book binding because I bind my own editions too. Did I mention all the tools that you were hoping? Speaking of which, we should go in there and... There's other people gathered as well. what's got called the Maximus poems, which is called I, Maximus of Gloucester to you. Offshore by islands in the blood, I, Maximus, a metal hot from boiling water, by ear, he said. But that which matters, that which insists, that which will last, where shall you find it, my people? How, where shall you listen when all has become billboards? When all, even silence is, when even the gulls, my roof, when even you, when sound itself. Where Portuguese Hill, she sang, and over the water at Tars, the water glowed, the light west, black gold, the tide outward at evening. The fixed bells rang, their voices came like boats over the oil slicks, like milkweed hulls, and a man slumped, attentionless, against pink shingles. 
sea city. One loves only form, and form only comes into existence when the thing is born. Born of yourself, born of hay and cotton struts, of street pickings, wharves, weeds, you carry in my bird. Of a bone of a fish, of a straw or will, of a color of a bell, of yourself torn. O bird, O Kelix, O Anthony of Padua, sweep low, bless the roofs, the gentle steep ones on whose ridge poles the gulls sit from which they depart and the flake racks of my city. Love is form and cannot be without important substance. The weight, say, 50 carats, each one of us perforce our own goldsmith scale. Feather to feather added. And what is mineral? What is curling hair? What string you carry in your nervous beak? These make bulk. These, in the end, are some. O oh, my lady of good voyage, in whose arm, in whose left arm rests no boy, but a carefully painted schooner, a delicate mask, a bowsprit for forwarding. The underpart is, though stemmed uncertain, is as sex is, as monies are, facts to be dealt with, as the sea is, the demand that they be played by, that they only can be, that they must be played by city coldly, the yeah. air. But love is not easy, and how shall you know New England, now that pedurocracy is here, now that streetcars of Oregon twitter in the afternoon, offend a gold black loin? How shall you strike, sword fisherman, the blue red back when last night your aim was music, 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 and not the cribbage game? Oh, Gloucesterman, Weave your birds and fingers new, your rooftops clean shat on, racks sunned on, American, braid with others like you, such extricable surface as fawn and oral satia, lesbos base. Oh, kill, 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 kill those who advertise you out. In the bowsprit, bird beak, in the act. Is goes in the form, what holds, what you make, what is the object, strut, strut, what you are, what you must be, what you can write now, here, here in after erect. Offshore, as I see it, over the waters from this place where I am, where I hear, where I can still hear, from where I carry you a feather as though sharply I picked up in the first of morning delivered you a jewel, it flashing more than a wing than any old romantic thing, than memory, than place, than anything other than that which you also carry, than that which is, call it a nest, around the bend of, call it the next second. <laughs> Library Lowdown of the Week. Did you know that the Library of Congress has a special project called Chronicling America, in which they've digitized historic American newspapers? Let's take a look, shall we? Just doing a quick keyword search using the keyword poetry. An example of what you can find is a newspaper called The Daybook, published in Chicago, and Chronicling America will tell us that The Daybook was conceived by the newspaper mogul Edward Willis Scripps as an experiment in advertisement-free newspaper publishing. It was originally published for a working-class readership Mondays through Saturdays from September 28, 1911 to July 6, 1917. We can see here from February the 4th, 1914, the new noon edition, we are given two pages titled We Women Can Have Children and Career. The article is a small feature piece on the artist Blanche Bates Creel, who provides an illustration to go alongside the feature, which has a bit of an Aubrey Beardsley Art Nouveau tinge to it, titled Babies in a Career, Both Are Possible. And we'll just read to you from some of the information on the newspaper page. Quote, which should a woman choose? Babies or art? A great talent or a great love? Some extreme feminists of today believe the real reason why the work of men in art and music, poetry, there's our keyword, and science, has been so much greater than that of women is because every year until the last century thousands of feminine geniuses have been fed to the minotaur of marriage. 
What we love about this resource is the fact that you can download any of these pages, either as a PDF or as an image file. So do take a look. It's at www.chroniclingamerica.loc.gov. Thank you to the itinerary poetry librarian, sacrifice to the minotaur of marriage. Um, that uh, That's quite something. So back to the studio where there is a Fast and Furious trade in History Society Party tickets. Um, we have time just now for How British is Tamsin. Now, this is a very, very important um, segment because I actually have to take this test on Saturday and... I've paid 50 quid, and if I fail it, which I have consistently been doing on the uh, app, then I'll have to reset it with, for another 50 quid. So that would be bad. 50 quid, I know. Okay, guys, so you've got to hit me. Hit me with some questions. Oh, mic's on. Right, this is a famous one. Which tribal leader, leader fought against the uh, Roman occupation of Britain? Bodisha. Bodica. <laughs> Is that right? Woohoo! Boudicca. 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 Do you know which uh, tribe she was the queen of? No. Nah. I see nigh. I see nigh. God, I hope they don't. Is that and... really a question? <laughs> no, just an interesting fact. Oh, God. Okay, because they said I don't have to know the history section. You're a historian, aren't you? I know, but yes, yes. Not of the 10th century. Um, okay. Go. Uh, hard one. Which king defeated the Vikings at the end of the ninth century? Um, Alfred. He has an epithet. The Great. <laughs> okay, these are not in the sure. test. These questions. They're the history ones. Give me some. Give me some. Like, how many Muslims are there in Wales? Type questions. <laughs> but where is that? Okay. I think it's two point seven. Great. That's. <laughs> probably right. The whole <laughs> it's probably three families. Yeah. Fine. Let's see him. Which Prime Minister oversaw the introduction of the National Health Service? He. No. Oh, I God, I don't know. Bevan Beveridge. <laughs> Bevan Churchill. Beveridge. <laughs> <laughs> I should so well, know. To be fair, well, sort of close. Question. What's the freaking answer? Bevan um, was his foreign secretary. Oh, who's the dude? Who's the dude? Atley. Atley! Ugh! Okay. Okay, Tavinda, what's next? Anyone? Right, anyone? see. Which monarch was overthrown by Cromwell? Which what? Monarch. Oh, Charles the William and Charles. <laughs> <laughs> Charles and William. And so appalled right now. <laughs> Charles and William. Charles and oh, well, William. Charles the William the tenth. <laughs> <laughs> Charles the fourth. Charles, Charles the first. Charles the first. The fourth. Is there a Charles the fourth? Oh, okay. okay, look. Serious question now. In which year did married women get the right to divorce their husband? Ooh. 1857. <laughs> you trying to get that answer out was just. <laughs> well, um... 1882. 1857. <laughs> 1885. 18... <laughs> okay, let's say. 1875. Yay! <laughs> you just oh failed. my god. We got that. What else do we have? What else do we have? We've got time for. Well, I'm going to give you a history question now. Even no, though no, we've you... had too many of them. I need, okay. like... All right. Which of these statements is correct? Children aged 13 to 16 years cannot work for more than 12 hours in any school week or children aged 13 to 16 years cannot work for more than 10 hours in any school oh week. Oh, my God. So, basically, can they work 10 or 12 hours? Yes. They Which can one? work 10, but not 12. Yes. Because that's a round number. And I that's correct. And it would really ridiculous <laughs> if they made it 12. That is correct. <laughs> oh. Uh, so, another statement. Which, is, which of these statements is correct? Children under 16 are not allowed to work in a kitchen but can deliver milk. Or children under 16 are not allowed to work in a kitchen or deliver milk. No, they can. They can deliver milk. Sorry. How do you know that? Which, which chapter did you read, read that at? I mean, yeah, how many milk delivering kids do you know? <laughs> have you, have you, are you watching Don't movies? Don't kids deliver something? milk? Is that, yes. Yes, they, you're, you're right. Yeah, they can't work a... in a kitchen, but they can deliver milk. Can't they work in a kitchen? Gosh. Um, this is ridiculous. <laughs> this is totally Health and ridiculous. safety. Yeah, they might Welcome fall in, me. fall into the grinder. Um, <laughs> fall into the grinder. Well, that's what happened with the Japanese man and the robot. <laughs> Did you have a grinder? Yeah, he no, fell into the grinder. Yeah. Oh. He got pushed in by his robot. Yeah, of course. 
All right, another um, true or false statement. Uh, there are more women than men in the Brit- in Britain. True! There are 51% of the population is female. I read that on the train on the way in. There was literally like a Eureka light bulb pop your head. I know this! It's true! Also, there are more women in higher education than men. True fact. Woo-hoo. Okay, so we're going to... Um, we're going to draw to a close. I think our next... Um, our next segment is waiting in the studio so thank you very much everyone for history pitch five we'll see you next week for our last show of this term um it's been lovely as always